Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the opening of Somos Latinas, our journey to Lawrence and beyond. My name is Sarah Morin Barth, and I'm the community team leader for this exhibit. Today is a very exciting day for the city of Lawrence. Lawrence has always been rich in history and welcoming of immigrants from all across the world. And today we're adding a new story by adding the Latino story to that history. Throughout this time, immigrants from all over the world have added their culture and their traditions. And today through this exhibit, we get to see more. As of right now, this is a temporary exhibit, but it is my hope, and hopefully after you see it, it's your hope too, that this becomes a permanent fixture in the Lawrence Heritage State Park. This exhibit was created by the community and for the community. I would like to ask the members of those that were on the community team that worked with me for several months to just please stand up um, and give them a round of applause. Thank you all so much. There was a team of about 10 of us that went through content, images, photographs, listened to oral histories, transcribed a lot of them, and went through all of them. So that was a lot of work. Thank you to the entire team for that. I would like to acknowledge Ashley Rosario of Elevated Thought for her ability to capture the beauty of Lawrence through her original artwork and, for, and all of the exhibit panels, but also work so closely with us to ensure that everything would be so reflective of the community. So thank you, Ashley. I'd like to thank our student interns who assisted with this um, project through providing translations, putting together archival references, and putting together the content for us, and also the ones that supported us through community engagement. So, Sibelle, Nicole Savando, and Juliana Speranza, thank you so much for your hard work. Nicole, I think you're around here. <laughs> there you are. Thank you. I'd like to thank the project support team that provided guidance to the community team. They kept us on track with deadlines and supported us with a historical timeline to base the themes off of. So thank you to James Beauchene, Mark Cutler, Susan Grabski, Kristen Clarity, Amita Kylie. Thank you all so much for supporting us. I'd like to thank Al Brandano, the founder of The Voice Library, for helping us put together this oral history kiosk. Please go visit. We hope to hear your stories today. And if, if you're not ready for today, hopefully there's a tomorrow because you're really making up this history because every day we're making history in Lawrence. So thank you. Thank you for being here, Al. This exhibit is sponsored by the Friends of the Lawrence Heritage State Park, and it's been created in partnership with the Lawrence community, the Lawrence History Center, and the Nobius Project, with funding from Mass Humanities Mass Cultural Council through the expanded Expand Massachusetts Story Initiative, which is a really big thing because we really need to expand our stories, and this is just one step in the right direction. There was also support from um, Catherine McCarthy. Memorial Trust, the White Fund, the Nathaniel and Elizabeth Stevens Foundation, and the Rosman Family Foundation of Essex County Community Foundation. I would also like to thank the Latino community for providing the rich history to share in this exhibit. And I'm going to conclude my remarks today in Spanish. Buenas tardes y bienvenidos a todos. Me llamo Sarah Morenbarth. Soy una directora del equipo comunidad para la exhibición Somos Latinos, nuestro viaje a Somos y Más or Lawrence y Mas. La exhibición es muy importante para la comunidad latina y la ciudad. Estamos agregando, agregando otra voz a la historia de Lawrence. La exhibición fue creado por la comunidad para la comunidad. Espero que lo disfruten y que compartan su historia de por qué Lawrence. Gracias a todos aquellos que con su apoyo se hizo posible. Muchas gracias. So we have a few speakers today, and I'd like to start with Jimbo Shane, president of the Friends of the Lawrence Heritage Chief. Thank you. Hi, everybody. How's that? Okay. 
Um, welcome and good afternoon. Bienvenido y buenos tardes. And I, and I can assure you that's all the Spanish you're going to hear from me. Um, but anyway, uh, again, thanks for coming out. Um, I am, as uh, Sarah said, the president of the Friends of Lawrence Heritage State Park, which is a nonprofit organization that supports the park in a number of ways, um, and which also served as the uh, kind of the home base for this project, although uh, uh, we didn't contribute as nearly as much as some of the other people you're going to hear about today. Um, now, as some of you know, I used to work here. I worked here for 23 years, uh, which was a great privilege to be able to tell the story of my hometown, Lawrence, Massachusetts. Um, now, those 23 years are actually a majority of the years that this place has existed. The visitor center here opened in 1986. Um, and it was a major investment by the State Parks Department, and it is still a beautiful facility. But as many of you know, the exhibit downstairs on the first two floors, what we call our permanent exhibit on the history of Lawrence, has not changed in those 37 years, um, which is a significant chunk of time. Um, in fact, as I uh, recently figured out, in the history of Lawrence, which began in 1845, 178 years. The 37 years since we opened is actually 20% of Lawrence's entire history. Um, so the fact that the, these last 37 years are not reflected in the exhibit downstairs is a serious gap in what we uh, present to the public. And we knew that increasingly over recent years and it was mentioned to us by uh, some visitors and uh, uh, we were well aware that some of the young kids who come in here with school groups are not seeing their own family histories and stories reflected in the exhibit. So when the Mass Humanities grant became uh, known to us, uh, we jumped on it. And uh, with a lot of hard work by a lot of people, uh, we're able to create the exhibit you see today, or will see today. And as you heard, uh, from Sarah. This is a, a kind of a prototype for what hopefully will become an addition to the permanent exhibit uh, downstairs. So that's something we're looking forward to in the future. Um, but for now, it's here until uh, late July, I believe, and we hope you'll uh, come back again to see it and tell everybody you know uh, to come and see it. The visitor center here is open seven days a week from nine to four. I have one other important duty here uh, in my talk, and that is to uh, give some uh, special things to some special people who made this all possible. And they are our wonderful designer, Ashley Rosario. Come on up, Ashley. Next is our uh, archivist extraordinaire at the Lawrence History Center who does uh, so much it cannot be summarized or categorized. Basically, she's all things to all people. Uh, Amita Kiley. And last but not least, the gal who took on managing this uh, very unwieldy project and managed to herd the cats together enough to get it done. Um, also our MC for today, Sarah Morin Barth. Um, and last but not least, I just want to mention that the Friends of the Park um, which is kind of the caretaker of this, of this project, um, is a great little organization, and you're all welcome to join it if you would like to uh, help us uh, supporting the park. So this is our brochure, talks about us, and it's available in the back, and of course, you can come and talk to me anytime today about joining the Friends. Thank you. 
Thank you all so much. That was very thoughtful and totally unexpected. <laughs> um, next, I'd like to welcome Ashley Rosario from Elevated Thought, our graphic designer for this beautiful exhibit. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> my name is Ashley Rosario. I'm a graphic designer at Elevated Thought. And for me, it was an honor to be part of this project and be able to be a small part to tell the story of Latinos in Lawrence. Uh, my parents immigrated here from the Dominican Republic to make my, my life and my sister's future better. Uh, and I'm forever grateful for them uh, to take on such a big journey. Um, and this is just one small story of all of the stories here in Lawrence. Um, I wanted to show how colorful and vibrant our culture is, and I wanted to be able for English speakers and Spanish speakers to be equally able to experience this exhibit. I hope that this is just the start of having our story and other stories that are not being told to be represented more. And um, in Spanish, uh, Para mí ha sido un orgullo ser parte de esta exhibición, ya que nuestras historias no siempre son contadas así como las estamos contando hoy. Uh, espero que esto continúe, continúe y siga creciendo. Muchas gracias. Next, I'd like to welcome Amita Kiley, the Collections Manager for the Lawrence History Center. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. The Lawrence History Center is a community archive dedicated to collect, sorry, collecting, preserving, sharing, and animating the history and heritage of Lawrence and its people. We were founded in 1978 as the Immigrant City Archives by a German immigrant named Ertha Dengler. Ertha realized how many immigrants like herself needed a place that would listen to their story and preserve their memories, so she founded an organization to do just that. What you will see in the exhibit today are stories and memories and photos that were shared by the Latino community with the Immigrant City Archives and with the Lawrence History Center since 1978. In our collection, we have photographs, oral histories, objects, written information, diaries, letters, anything you can think of that reflect the history and heritage of Lawrence. And we have a very large collection on the Latino community. Our role in this exhibit was to make that collection available to the community content team so that they could look through the items and decide what they wanted to incorporate into this exhibit. The exhibit offers only a small, small portion of what we have in the archives. And we invite you to come to the Lawrence History Center to look at everything else that we have, to see things in person, to interact with what we have. You can go to the Lawrence History Center website, lawrencehistory.org, or scan the QR codes in the, in the exhibit to listen to full oral histories. You'll see quotes from them, but you can hear the full stories and the people's voices. You can read transcriptions that we have, and you can look at the thousands of photos photographs and thousands of paper documents that we have in the collection. I'd like to highlight quickly Adira Batance Smaldoon, who has donated so much of what we have in the archives and so much of what you'll see in the exhibit. The exhibit wouldn't be as rich as it is without Yadira's donations over the years. And most importantly, we're always collecting Lawrence history. You can see it today as we're filming this and taking photos, and we're collecting stories today in the oral history booth. That's a job that doesn't stop. Documenting the city's history never stops because we have to make sure that we record what's happening now for people in five years, 10 years, 20 years, because they'll want to know about this time. So we invite you to complete an oral history today, maybe a brief one in our booth today, or schedule a longer one with the Lawrence History Center and with the Voice Project. Um, you can donate a family photo to our archives or your family story or flyers from events you go to. All of this helps tell the story of our city. This exhibit was made possible because of the wonderful material that was shared over the last 45 years. We hope today kicks off another 45 years of collecting, preserving, sharing, and animating Lawrence's Latino history. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd 
Next, I'd like to invite Catherine Stevens from Mass Humanities to say a few words. Catherine. Thank you, um, and thank you for having me in Lawrence. This is my first time in Lawrence, and it is a great introduction to the city. Uh, so Mass Humanities creates opportunities for the people of Massachusetts to transform their lives and build a more equitable commonwealth through the humanities. And when I explain it to people, people often ask me what I what are the humanities or what do I mean by the humanities? Um, and there are lots of dictionary definitions of what the humanities are, but I always try to answer with an example. And in fact, I have said, there's this project in Lawrence called Somos Latinos, and I can't wait to see it, and I start describing the project. Um, in 2021, Mass Humanities launched the Expand Massachusetts Stories Grant Opportunity to support projects that find and tell uh, stories of our state, and particularly those that have gone unrecognized or have not yet been included in public conversation or have been misrepresented in public conversation. Somos Latinos was part of that first group of projects that we were able to support, and it is a real joy to get to see it, um, to see, come together, to see the final panels and the design. I think most importantly, it is a project that's a collaboration. Um, as Sarah explained, the teams that were part of it in her introduction, so not just institutions, um, but community members who've taken um, and shared their time, shared their memories, shared their ideas and their aspirations for this city. I think this is how we come to tell a more complete story of Massachusetts and its communities. Um, it is a story that is ongoing. It's a story that is complex and it is a story that I think as you see in the panels is colorful. So now I'm happy that when people ask me what I mean by the humanities, I can say there's this project in Lawrence called Somos Latinos and you have to go see it. You have to go see it. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I really appreciate you know, your willingness to share our story because that's really what it comes down to. Um, our next speaker is our keynote speaker for today. And when thinking about who we could have speak, this person I was introduced to from a job and we, she asked me to join her to bring a new group of new locals around the city to talk about the city of Lawrence and its history. And listening to her speak about the history and her lived experiences, both beautiful and sometimes a little chaotic in Lawrence, right? Um, you know, reminded me why we're here. You know, you, you're, we're here, we see the, the beauty, we see the, you know, sometimes the bad, the ugly, but we're still here, and that's a beautiful thing to be. So um, I'd like to have Delia Duran-Clark please come up and give our keynote. Thank you. I was sort of fearing this moment and, and excited about the moment, right? I came in with so much confidence. I'm going to speak. This is what I do. I speak. And uh, Susan greeted me and said, oh, you are the kind of speaker. And I'm like, am I? <laughs> totally, but that word just threw me off, right? And, and then another thing that threw me off was that I wasn't expecting my kids to be here today because we have a really big celebration back at home and we've been decorating our backyard this morning and everything and, and I, you know, I'm good, you don't have to come and they are here. So I am totally, um, thank you. Ever get emotional when I speak or feel that I'm emotional. I, I thought it was the AC for one minute. I said, I think it's just because the AC, I'm a little cold. It's not. When you asked me to talk about Lawrence, Lawrence to me has been my mother. It's protection, it's nourishment, it's poetry, it's resilience, it's history. And today, Today, I thought to myself as I am walking and reading, I can't believe I am part of this amazing history. I am Lawrence. My kids are Lawrence. They love our city. And I love the word barrio when I refer to Lawrence because I grew up in a barrio in Dominican Republic. And I, I came here when I was 12 years old. I've been here for 40 years of my life. And it has been an amazing journey. And the strength that Lawrence, our city, gives us, the, the native, the visitors, the people, the, it's, just, it's just something that you can't capture 
you can't, it doesn't matter how I describe it. I am here today and there is a couple, a couple here that are La Mirabal, Eleonor y Estelvi Mirabal. I introduced them so many years ago. How many years ago did I introduce you? 22 years ago. I didn't expect to see them here. But the funny story about them is that um, they got married. And I was, uh, I was the uh, maid of honor at the wedding. And I think, I think there were four people at that wedding. And I was one of them. And 22 years later, here they are. And I wasn't expecting to see them here. And their story, their story is also captured here. I came to this um, country in 1982. And the beauty of that moment was that it was 16th of December. And I was uh, 11 years old. I was 12. I was 12. I had turned 12 years old. And push factors, right? My mom, my dad had come a year before and they wanted to bring us here. I was promised, I was promised you're going to go back. And the reason why I wanted to go back to Dominican Republic was I was what you could say academically, academically okay. So I got a scholarship to not only start high school in DR, but also to finish um, medical school. I wanted to be a doctor. And at age 11, I was granted this scholarship. And I wanted to study in DR, but my parents lie. <laughs> they lie. And they say, you come over and then we'll send you. Once we were here, they said, now you can work for your ticket and get back. Of course, it wasn't going to happen. Then I met Los Mirabales that you're going to see here. And in 19, from 1982 to 1987, I had the best relationships of my life. These people, these friends, they're still part of my life. And we're not friends, we are family. Stelvin is one key, key, key person here in Lawrence. He brings us together. We just got together about a month ago, and there were over 100 people from those times. We came to the history of our history is that in, from that time, it was bilingual school. We went to school in Spanish here in Lawrence, and we took ESL, which was a good thing and a bad thing, I think, right? I'm a principal of a school right now in, in, in Lawrence, and I know how important it is to keep your Spanish alive. But for us, it, was, it meant that it gave us comfort in our language. But it also meant that we were isolated from the mainstream society. And it, of course, 40 years later, we continue to be best friends. But that 16th of December, what you need to know about that 16 was that we arrived in New York City. Four kids, dressed like it's 90 degree weather. And my parents, my, my dad didn't know my dad did not know that he could take a day off. He was afraid that he could, if, we take, if he took a day off, he was going to fire. So my mom went to get us to, with someone that they paid to New York City, and we drove back from, from New York here, and it took seven hours. I remember that it was. And when we arrived, my dad was getting ready to go in a van that provided transportation to the people that didn't, that didn't drive at that time. And he was going down 319 Lowell Street. We live on 319 Lowell Street. And it, that's a very historical part of Lawrence, too. And I'll talk a little bit more about that because we lived through the riot of Lawrence of 1984. But in 1982, when we arrived, my dad went down the stairs. And I will forever remember this moment and why Lawrence, right? And I will always, and I keep talking to you about why Lawrence, why not? That day, my dad went down the stairs, and there's the van waiting for him. And we arrived at the same moment he was getting inside the van. I don't know if it was 6 o'clock, but I can tell you it was the coldest day of our lives. 16 of December, and we had no coats. And we were dressed as if we were 90 degree weather. I'm repeating myself so that you can just envision it's dark outside. And my dad, it's inside the van, and, the, and my mom said, he's leaving, beep the horn, tocale la bocina para que no se vaya. And they stopped. And my dad comes out. It's the first and only time I saw my dad cry. But guess what? He went to work. He went to work, and years later, that stayed with me. And I asked him, why didn't you stay? We haven't seen you in four years. Your kids arrived. Why didn't you stay? He said to me, 
¿Qué tú quieres? ¿Que me voten del trabajo? I would have gotten fired if I had stayed. That marked me. Fast forward to 1987. I graduated college at age 17. It was a one-year certificate college. And I went to work. And of course, Lawrence Eagle Tribune at that time went to my college place, which was Essex Agricultural and Technical Institute, and I became a medical assistant. They took a picture, a photograph, and that photograph made it to Lawrence, Lawrence Eagle Tribune. It was called the Lawrence Eagle Tribune. I get a phone call at home. It was very easy. You don't know about this, but there's books called Yellow Pages. And in those yellow pages, we found, you find people's number. And the uh, director found my name and number and called me and offered me an interview. I was 17 years old. My first paycheck was $217. My mom was 114, working three jobs. But her full-time job was $114. I saw the power of education in that paycheck. That also marked me. I knew that with one year of college, I was making $217. Of course, being Latino and arriving with everyone else, that means you came home, you gave your paycheck, my dad would give me $50 out of my $214 and give each one of my siblings $10. And then everything else was a family bank account. Pay rent, money back to DR. Uh, we wanted to buy a house, which we did later on on Oxford Street. Now, fast forward to 1980, back 1984, the riot in Lawrence. How many of you remember or have lived or have heard about the riot in Lawrence? Please Google it. It was the scariest couple of days of our life as kids. I live on 151 Oxford Street. The riot was between 151 and 149. So it was a racial riot. Some people said when I was, I was 12 years old, 13 years old, and I remember that they stated it was because of a dog. Somebody stated that it was because of a child. Somebody said it was because of uh, alcohol. It was race-induced. That I knew. And I knew that because my house was right next to the liquor store that blew up in flames, and we were the only black family living within this about nine homes of uh, French Canadian. French Canadian, and we had rented a first floor apartment. We were afraid to get out. We were afraid to leave our house. And our parents, my mom and my dad, with the four of us in a room, the house is on fire. Our house is on fire on that side. We are for the, to the far street. This is where you are, exactly where you are. And there are windows there. And the people next door are French Canadian. And they're saying to us, come over and we can't, we are paralyzed. Another moment that marked me, when this guy came into our room, bedroom, and started lifting us up and basically throwing us out the window. And he saved us. That moment marked me, I trust humanity, not colors. That was a big lesson for me. And I'm not sure if my kids have ever heard that story before. That was the riot of 1984 here in Lawrence. Right? I graduated Lawrence High School in 1986. Beautiful building here with very limited word of English. And I decided that I was not going to go to Northern Essex. So all of my friends went to Northern Essex. And I said, I want, I want something. I want to go to college. Northern Essex to me wasn't a college. And mind you, I graduated from Northern Essex later on. <laughs> Very proudly, I did. And I went to Essex Agricultural and Technical Institute with no English, very limited English, no cars, no transportation. But again, it was that community. This is my community. This is White Lawrence. There was someone that was going to Northern Essex, to Essex Aggie, that drove me every day. By the time I graduated, I don't know if you have seen the uh, play or movie, The West Side, no, In the Heights. All right, so she reminds me so much of me. Once I graduated from four years of school, I have more school than anyone else I know, and believe me, just one certificate here, one certificate there. We closed the street on Oxford Street because I was graduating college. I lived on Oxford Street and Champlain Street, this uh, uh, dead end, 
And without asking the mayor, the city councils, we just closed the street and had the biggest fiesta because I was graduating college. Right? So Lawrence has given me the best memories, the best experiences of my life. I'm a black Dominican. I am a Dominican woman. When I graduated after my first master's degree, left this country because I thought that I wasn't Dominican enough. I went to college and people thought that I was African-American and I didn't know what it was to be. I said, but I'm Dominican, what does that mean? Well, I'm from Lawrence, what does that mean? I left, I left this country thinking, I need to find out where is home? Am I Dominican or I am from Lawrence? I lived in Dominican for two, three years at that time. And I did a lot of work and a lot of writing and a lot of searching. And at some, and I remember June, it was June of 2000, I said, I'm going back home. And I'm not ashamed to say that as a Dominican person. I'm not. Lawrence is home. I grew up in Lawrence. My biggest love and affections are in Lawrence. My experiences are in Lawrence. And when I lived in Dominican Republic, we didn't have Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram. So it was really hard to keep in touch with people. 40 years later, this is what I consider home, right? And I will say now, I live in Andover. Correction, I sleep in Andover. I live in Lawrence. I will take that as a cue to sit down, but I have more stories to tell you. Uh, when I asked Sarah how many minutes, she said three, I said, what? She said three to five, I said, what do you mean? I need more. I am a storyteller, and growing up in Lawrence, it's impossible not to have stories. It's impossible, I'll tell you one last story. Prom, prom, Lawrence High School, $35 a ticket. 1986, remember that? 1986, we have no money. My mom was getting paid $3.35 an hour. $35 a ticket, and then the dress, and then the, the car, and, and, and all of that. We Latinos came together, and we decided to have our own prom. And we decided to have it in Los Club Los Trinitarios, which was our home at that time. It was a social club, and if you want to hear back there, you were going to listen to this oral story by Mira, uh, Estelvi Mirabal about Los Trinitarios. It was a safe space for the youth in Lawrence at that time. And we went there and we did this amazing prom. My dress was rented for $7. It was beautiful, <laughs> beautiful, beautiful dress. And we all rented cars, I mean, rent, uh, uh, limo. <laughs> oh my God, you, don't, you didn't get it, you didn't get it. No, 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 no. I remember walking from Oxford Street to Cedardale, with Cedardale back then, where Dunkin uh, Burger King is, and in front of it we had a club, and I walked in my heels, also white. Can you imagine white and white it was just not really pretty? And I walked there, and uh, we had the best time, and we ended around four o'clock in the morning. Next, mo next Monday, my sister who died, and I were called to the principal's office. We divided the school. They, um, I, I felt threatened at that time because I couldn't tell my parents what was going on. My parents would have been upset. Mind you, culturally, teachers have the highest status, teachers, priests, and doctors. And if I had told my mom that the school was mad at us because we did a prom, and they said, next time you do something like this, you're going to be expelled from school. That was our prom, right? That was my sister and I in that office because we were leading that event. But what they didn't know though was that my parents didn't speak English and work three jobs. And that the way that the school worked, it didn't facilitate my parents being involved in the school. It didn't facilitate for us to be able to go to the amazing prom that everyone had and we were dying to go to. They didn't know that because they never asked. A moment that marked my life, equity, not equality. I am 
a proud principal of a school right now. And every single one of my girls is known and seen, not just a number or a Latino name on a roster. I am full of stories. Again, I can tell you a thousand and one story about growing up in Lawrence. But what I will tell you is that Lawrence is strength. Lawrence is community. If not, you should have been here for the glass explosion. We come together. We, we love joy. The smell of our streets, fried chicken, and merengue, and bachata. In, in most places, you, need, you really need Spanish to survive here. When I came, it was English. Now it's a transformation of, and I'm not saying this last, I'm saying it's just a transformation. Someone dared to say to me, the downtown is dying now because of all these new businesses and different businesses and the language. And I said, no, the downtown is different. It's different. And it's, it's, it's mirroring the people that live in the community. Um, if you are not from Lawrence, I invite you to stay. Because you are in for a trip of love. Um, it just feels that well, it hugs you everywhere you go. Um, Maria and I get together sometimes because I see her at the tree shop. Um, and, and it's just for fun. Not long ago, everywhere. I go to a restaurant, it's impossible not to see Jonathan, right? <laughs> uh, at an event, because we get to know each other. We know the people in our community. I have more, but I'm going to sit down now because I think I've been talking. My daughter just said yes to sit down. Um, yeah, I'm going to do that. It was, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. By all means, thank you. Thank you for that, Delia, and I hope that you can go into the booth and record more for us because that would be an amazing oral history to hear from, and I think if you do decide, we'll all be waiting to hear your story. So thank you, Delia, for that. Um, we're going to end today with a um, performance. So in the meantime, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Stelvin and his family because I'm very excited. Um, for those of you out of town, um, Every year we have Semana España, and that is a week-long celebration of all different types of um, Latino communities, Guatemalan, Ecuadorian, Dominican, Puerto Rican, you name it, we're all here to celebrate each other and uplift each other, which is a really beautiful thing. So at the very end of the week, we get together in the North Common, and we have a giant party with food and dancing and pure joy. And... Stelvin has had his really beautiful costumes that he um, has made and brought over from the DR. And when he first started to bring this tradition over here to the United States, I remember listening to him tell his story about when Semana España was happening, he snuck in his performance to the Semana España parade. And over time, after sneaking in and then finally going through the process of everything, they welcomed him. <laughs> and we have been enjoying his performances ever since. Now, the beauty of this year is that Stelvin and his wife are the grand marshals of the Semana España Parade. And I think... <laughs> I think that speaks very beautifully about what we do in our city in terms of welcoming new traditions and culture. So Stelvin, congratulations to you and your wife and your family for bringing this tradition over here. We truly appreciate it and we're looking forward to your performance. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you all so much for that amazing performance. <laughs> from Lawrence. I hope to see you on the parade route so we can cheer on Selvin and his family and can see more of their performance. And if you're not from Lawrence, please come back and visit Semana Espana, especially next weekend, because it's going to be a really beautiful event celebrating all of this. But this concludes our presentation, and I encourage you to not only check out this exhibit that we've created up here, but take a look at the second floor, check out the exhibits down there, and you'll see the importance as to why this you know, this exhibit means so much to the community. Thank you so much for coming today. We really appreciate it.